So today we're gonna do something a little different from Born for the Legends. Um, a few years ago, I made a pretty deep study of the games of Marcel Duchamp, who is way more famous, not in the chess world, but in what world? That's right, in the art world. So there's a lot of interest in Marcel Duchamp across the street. And the reason that there's so many interconnections between chess and art is partly because Marcel Duchamp was such an aficionado of the game of chess. Um, not only was he one of the most influential artists ever, but he also played chess at the master level and even gave up his art career for a time so that he could focus only on chess. Um, part of the reason that I think he's such an impressive artist is that um, it was really important in his career that he didn't like want to copy himself and just like do the same thing over and over and just get paid, you know, like make a painting very similar to one that he did before so that he could keep making a lot of money, which is of course very smart, but he rejected that because he didn't think that was like the artistic thing to do. And so that's one of the reasons he got into chess because in chess um, you never play the same game, right? Well, very, very rarely. Um, in my last class, I was teaching um, about the scholars made and how to prevent it to people just starting out. And of course, that's the exception that many youngsters play the scholars made five or six times until they um, get so strong that their opponents start, um, start stopping it, right? No scholars made for you, right, Winston? Yeah. That's right, no scholars made for you. So this is one of Marcel Duchamp's games. Um, he's playing with white in this position. And the question is, what would you do for white and try to calculate how the game might conclude? So Marcel Duchamp, born in France, spent a lot of time in the United States. Moved here at some point, living in New York. So let's take a little more time, see if everybody has an idea. So you're looking at rook d6, bishop d6, queen takes e6 check. Um, you're looking at rook f7, and then pawn takes d6, right? So my question is, do you stop analyzing at that point, or do you think it's like necessary to calculate the checkmate, or do you feel like you did enough? I mean, I would, I would still keep calculating, but mm -hmm. at least I know that worst case, I've, I've opened up my bishop, I've gotten a stronger attack, so um, I mean, if I couldn't find a definitive checkmate, I'd still play the move. Okay, so excellent. That's a good response. I mean, I think like it depends on how much time you have on your clock, right? But in this position, there are certain sacrifices where you really need to be sure you, you calculate to something definitive like a checkmate. For instance, when you sacrifice a whole queen or when you sacrifice a rook for um, no, no other material, if you're not checkmating your opponent, you're going to be in big trouble, right? Whereas in this case, you really don't have to calculate the checkmate. And the reason is that after rook to d6, this excellent move, right? Very nice move. You really want to get the rook to d6. And at first, it looks like you can't because this bishop is guarding the square. But after a bishop takes d6, we now have a nice in-between move. Instead of just taking this, we instead interpolate what, Winston? Check. Check. Exactly. It's really important to insert this move. That's also called an in-between move. Plus, that's right, queen e6 plus. What is it called besides an intermediate move? Does anybody know the fancy German word for it, Ken? Oh, that's the Italian word for it. <laughs> Intermezzo, intermediate move. Yeah. Zwischenzug is apparently the best way to call it. Um, but you know that if a move has so many different names, it must be really good. <laughs> right? So qu queen takes e6 check, intermezzo. And now if the work blocks an f7, which is what happened in the game, after pawn takes d6, I agree that White does not have to calculate till checkmate here because our compensation is so overwhelming. We're not really down material, right? I mean, let's count this up, guys. What you, are we down material? No. no, we're actually even. And of course, even based on the materialistic quantification of these pieces, but in reality, we're a lot more than even, right? I mean, this bishop is an absolute monster now. Um, with all these squares. So when we took this pawn we took here, not only did we capture that bishop, but we made this bishop 
the best piece on the board, right? Um, furthermore, this pawn is also not, not a mere pawn, but a very important um, pass pawn. So white is crushing here. Now after queen d7, how many people trade queens? Raise your hand if you like to trade queens here. Okay. Nobody wants to trade queens. So sad. No, no, it's not sad at all. <laughs> it's very good. But um, what would you play? Wilson. Queen e5, that's right. Now, oh, that's great. You're related and you play the same move here. Um, well, queen to e5 is a really important move. Um, I mean, it seems really obvious now when I'm teaching you in, in a class, but as I talk about in almost every class, a lot of us and one of the frequent grandmasters in residence, Ben Feingold, I know it's one of his um, typical topics as well. Almost all chess players have this problem of trade-itis. They trade too much. Um, of course, this would be an, an extreme example of it. Queen takes d7 would be massively terrible. Um, even if white's doing pretty well here, it's not. I mean, if we could play e5 or something, it might be a little different. Even that wouldn't be nearly good enough. But after bishop e5, you can argue about white's massive compensation and even say, like, hey, white's going to be totally winning after this. But it's still not nearly as good as keeping queens on the board and not even have to calculate any of that, right? So that would be an egregious example of um, trade-itis. But there are many more minor examples that you should watch out for in your own game. Instead, uh, Marcel Duchamp did play queen to e5, and the game was over soon thereafter. I think actually this position was just resigns. Um, but um, this is the, the best thing for black to do now. Um, of course, this is a devastating threat of checkmate and one. So black has to move the rook, and there's not a lot of good squares to do it, because when you move the rook, we get to go queen h8 check, and then we take how many pawns? Too many pawns, right? We're up four pawns in this position. So we're down. What do you call it when we have a rook for a bishop? I know a lot of people know this, but um, what is that called? Do you know what that's called, Winston, when you have a rook and your opponent has a bishop? What are you up? <laughs> nice try, two pawns, but we have a special chess phrase for it. No, you don't, you don't know it, so that's okay. Um, Ken, yeah, we call it being up in exchange, all right? And, and I like the, uh, um, the in, in French, they call it the quality, the exchange quality. I like that. I don't think I'm saying that right, um, but I, I saw it written in French, and I was like, that makes a lot more sense than in English, because in English, being up in exchange, when you try to explain that to somebody who's just learning the rules, they're like, isn't every exchange an exchange? <laughs> but no, the, the exchange specifically means rook for bishop or knight. Um, and the reason we don't use uh, Winston's uh, two pawns is that, frankly, usually it's a little less than two pawns. Usually a bishop and two pawns are a bit better than a rock. So the exchange is like sacrificing somewhere between one and a half and two pawns usually. That's why it needs its own specific name. Yeah? Well, the problem is you're also down pawns, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. well, that's also just like, yeah, over. Yay! What are you going to promote to? A <laughs> Good. Good answer. <laughs> so are you trying to promote to a knight? No, that's too much fun. You're not supposed to have that much fun when you play chess. Unless your opponent's been really, really annoying. And even then, even then, I wouldn't do it. So that was a really nice victory, nice clean victory by Marcel Duchamp, which goes to show, I mean, and also remember this is in 1928. So it might seem really obvious to us now, but remember that a lot of these patterns, um, that's right, 1928 is right there because it's recorded with the game data. So a long time ago. And 1928, um, a lot of these patterns weren't as well known. Um, so you didn't like see a bunch of books with very similar sacrifices. So it required even more kind of um, creativity and imagination to find moves like Rook to D6, right? Um, in addition to in-between move, this has also got another name, this type of tactic. Anybody know? Yeah? 
Not really intermediate step. This is a kind of, a, yeah? Deflection. Not really deflection. Um, it's got a special name, yeah? Clearance. Clearance. Yes, clearance and also blocking. Blocking when you, like, when you interfere between two things and block the defense. So it's got, like most tactics in chess, it's a combination of different themes, right? So here's another one, another Duchamp game. This one he did not win, but that's OK. Here he is winning, though. He had a good move in this position. So he's white in this position. And as you can see, it's a kind of crazy material imbalance. White's got a queen for a rook, a knight, and a bishop. Hmm? Yeah. Um, so that's a really bizarre material imbalance. But what do you notice? So like in points, um, what's worth more, the rook, knight, and the bishop, or the queen? Right, but that's not the full story here, right? Because we didn't go count the pawns yet, right? White does have an extra pawn. And there's something else to this. What else is going on in this position that makes it much less clear than that? Um, well, Sonia? Yeah. yeah, that bishop here is, uh, is not got a lot of squares to go to, OK? So what would you do if you were white, though, to try to make this super clean? Um, means like you're doing well, so let's stop their counterplay. Let's make it so that they can't attack us too easily. Yeah? King F2, the, the problem here is that we're really worried about some kind of sacrifice. The, one of the um, important things in chess, uh, the stronger you get, which the great chess writer Dovoretsky talks about a lot, is prophylaxis. So you want to think about what your opponent's going to do. And in, in a, prophylaxis is like, basically, it's a fancy word for defense. But defense, even in positions where it doesn't seem like you should be defending, it's looking for your opponent's ideas and threats. And even though as white, you might be pretty excited about your position, your opponent's king is weak, you're going to take on h1, the bottom line is black still has ideas of his own. So let's make sure to keep our eyes open for them. OK, rook e4 is a great move because it, is, it actually does stop his ideas. Um, in the game, actually, Marcel Duchamp did not make that move. He played rook h4, kind of more going for that aggressive attack because he didn't he was thinking, my position's awesome. I'm going to win this game. So why not just try to take this pawn off and accentuate this weak king? All that makes sense. But we got to give our opponent some credit too, right? We always assume that our opponent's going to play the best moves. That's an important thing in chess. Because if you're wrong and your opponent plays bad moves, you're going to win anyway. So you might as well assume that they're going to play well. So after work to h4, um, what extra resource does black have now that makes the position very complicated? Okay? Bishop takes uh, f3. Exactly. Bishop takes f3 is what happened. We're going to look at that in a second. And now the game kind of blows up because black manages, after bishop f3, pawn f3, rook takes d3. Now everything's a mess, right? f3 is in take. And if they take on f3, our rook's in take. This rook is coming. This king is starting to get weak. So suddenly the position is super messy, right? Whereas after Wilson's move, rook e4, super solid, excellent move. Now, after bishop takes f3, instead of allowing this mess, what else can white do here? Now white has another choice. What's that? Capture the knight. Exactly. Now we just capture the knight. We don't deal with any of this funny business. And after we capture the knight, now the position is more simple. Now we just have a queen for a what? Uh, we just have a queen for a rook and a bishop, and look whose king is still super weak. Right? Black. Black's king is still very weak. Our king is looking a lot safer because the rooks aren't piling in like they were and like they do in the game. So very good move. And that's, that's about looking for your opponent's threats even when they haven't been playing well. Even if your opponent seems like they're, they're going down, they're not playing well, you still want to be vigilant and make sure that you're looking for all their ideas. So instead, rook h4, bishop takes f3, and now 
rook to d3, and I was just pointing out that this is now looking pretty ugly. Now, actually, in the game, um, Marcel Duchamp lost this game. He played the move queen to e2 and ended up losing. Um, but we're going to look at a way he could have played better. So if he had played queen c1 instead, this move is a little stronger because we are um, just for basically concrete reasons, but we're really trying to get some counterplay against this king as quickly as possible before it's too late. And now black played rook to d8 to protect this rook, right? Because taking this rook is still not possible because this rook isn't a, right? So rook to d8 instead, creating all sorts of interesting threats. Yes, white did check, actually. And now after king h8, now as you, think, as you can see, queen takes d3 is a move you would certainly look at. But at the end of the variation, uh, black does get to take on h4, so we don't end up up material like we would like to. So instead, rook takes h5, exactly. And now we do have some threats. Like we are threatening now. For instance, if black were to do something random here, now white would be able to play what? just to try to simplify the position and win easily without having to sweat too much. Yeah, now we could play queen takes d3 because there's no knight takes h4 at the end of the variation. I noticed that uh, Grandmaster Joel Benjamin recently came out with a book on simplification and liquidation. And um, it's a slippery slope. You don't want to go too far with it. Um, but and always look for ways to simplify because that can lead to trade-itis. But at the same time, when you're winning, it's really important to think of ways to just wipe everything off the board so that you can just be up a rook or up a piece or up an exchange and make the win easier. So um, black in this position played the move knight to g1 check. Um, and now white played king to e1. And black played back to f3. White played king e2, knight g1 check. Well, actually, this is a variation. So white is trying to win this game, but black keeps checking us, right? So let's try king f2 now. Now what can black do? We're trying to perpetual check white. Do you know what perpetual check is, Winston? OK. Keep on checking. That's right, keep on checking. Well, if we keep on checking our opponent, is that a win or a draw? draw. It's a draw, right? Well, you don't need to do it 50 times if it's a perpetual check, actually. Well, we have to do it Anybody see besides, uh, yeah? So rook, so rook f8 check is the right way. Very good. That's what you were going to say too, right, Wilson? Yeah. And now after king takes g1, your same idea of rook d1 check, but now the king can't come up. So even though we're up a queen, it doesn't help. The king has to keep in this box, right? So king g1, rook d1, king h2, rook d2 check, king h1, rook d1 check. So a really cool potential finish to that game, even though ultimately white should have just been winning the game with that rook e4 move that you suggested, right? But uh, this would have been another way to do it. Now, I actually made um, a video related to that, which I'll show you an excerpt of right now. So this is hula chess, which is a combination of hula hooping and chess. And you'll see, you'll recognize that position coming up in just a minute. So the idea of this is to be able to exercise and play chess at the same time. And you see that this position with the rook and the king coming back and forth, that's from that game. So exactly the same position. This is a short excerpt of it. It's only like 40 seconds long. There's a full version on YouTube where you can really see the entire end game that we just looked at play out. So I thought I'd show you that in, in homage to uh, Marcel Duchamp. 
So one more Marcelo Duchamp game that I want to show you. Um, this one, we'll look at the full game. So we were looking at excerpts before. But this time, we'll look at the full game. Um, I like that in this game, he played my favorite opening. Cecilia. Yeah. My brother's favorite. Aw. Now, anybody else here play the Sicilian? No? What, what's, up, what's up with that? Nobody plays the Sicilian in this chess club. Is this an anti-Sicilian chess club? What's that? Because of VAR? Because of VAR and um, no, Yasser? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but there's Yeah, that's how I said VAR. Varouche and Akopian, yeah. The French is a great opening, but the Sicilian's really cool. cool. The French is really boring sometimes. It's very closed. If you like the position to be closed, you like the French, but a lot of youngsters prefer playing open positions, so. Um, why, does anybody know why, why the French is so popular for somebody like Verouge and Agobian? Petrosian? Yes, because of Petrosian and um, the world champion who played the French. I'm not saying that's why Agobian played it, but it is very popular among Armenian players, or players of Armenian descent. So um, definitely a great resource, and the French is a great opening. I hated playing against it. Bobby Fischer hated playing against it. A lot of people hate playing against the French, but Sicilian's a really nice opening. And what variation of the Sicilian do you play? Um, you play Z4. Well, we're talking about as black. Z4. Which, as black, which, how do you develop your pieces here? Do you play, um, this is a little bit of a strange uh, way to develop. Usually black plays knight f6 earlier. But um, suppose um, white, so what would you play in this position? You play knight c6, and then when they play d4, what do you do? OK. And then when they take back, what do you do? Um, and then when they play here? I usually play OK, you should know what you do exactly, because these lines are very, very sharp, OK? So I would, uh, next time you work with your coach, um, I would make sure that you know exactly what you're doing in the Sicilian, um, because it sounds like you're a little shaky in the move order. OK? Because there's all sorts of ways to do it. You could play e6, and you could play d6, or you could try to fianchetto your bishop at some point. But um, it's the sharpest opening in chess, so you want to be really sure. In any case, in this game, Marcel Duchamp played a line called the dragon. Oh, dragon. Yeah, dragon's a cool opening. So the dragon is characterized by fianchettoing this bishop over here on the king's side. Yeah? This is kind of more of like an accelerated dragon, although with the accelerated dragon, usually the pawn's not even on d6 yet. So this is a, like a slightly strange move order where white, black has an early knight c6. Now, back in 1924, the, the Sicilian wasn't as popular as it is now. So probably they're just kind of experimenting a little bit. Bishop b5, what do you guys think of this move? Yay or nay? Yay or nay, and you say OK? Reasonable? Yeah, I think bishop d7 is the best move. And furthermore, I actually think that bishop b5 is not that good of a move. Because in the Sicilian, it kind of optically looks decent because it looks like you're being aggressive. But the reality is that you don't really want to trade this bishop off that much. You want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. And also, this bishop was going to go to d7 anyway. So you're just kind of helping me develop. And in fact, I might create some threats against this bishop that will help me with my attack later on. So bishop b5 is actually a move that shows that you maybe don't know what to do against a Sicilian. I like your idea of putting the bishop on c4 a lot better. Or even more so, normally in this position, white ends up castling in which direction? Queenside. So if we're going to castle queenside, what's more important to develop this bishop or this bishop? Queen bishop. Exactly. So Normally, we want to develop the f bishop first, but here we actually want to develop this bishop first, and maybe then the queen and castle. So certainly, bishop c4 is not a bad move, but okay. I would even prefer just to play bishop e3 right away and um, you know, just get, get, get on queenside castling ASAP. Yes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's risky, but it's, it's also the reason that so many people don't play the dragon, because it's a very strong line. 
If you are going to castle kingside, then you're gonna, then bishop c4 or bishop e2 are both better than bishop b5. So either one of those are OK if your plan is to castle kingside. Um, so bishop b5, not a great move, but obviously not a disaster yet. So now f3. f3 is a move that looks a lot prettier when we castle queenside. Because when we castle kingside, it creates some weaknesses. So again, in the opening battle, it seems like Marcel Duchamp knows what's going on a little bit better so far, right? All of his moves look fine. White's moves look a little bit shaky. Like, this whole idea of bishop e3, queen d2 is beautiful, but we want our king over here when we do it. So that we can then do, use these pawns to um, crush black, right? To open up those lines. Here he's kind of mixing up two ideas. So after queen a5, knight b3, queen c7, now white made this decision to take on c6. What do you think of that? Why do you not like that? Well, I would, th I would just simplify that and say that this position is pretty open. It's semi-open, as they say. One pair of pawns have been traded. But it's not on the same file, so there's not that many open lines. But that being said, in any semi-open or open position, you usually want to have a reason for trading a bishop for a knight. It's not good enough to have no reason. Um, bishops are slightly, slightly better than knights. And let's have a reason for it. Why are you taking on c6? Don't just do it because it's possible. Again, that's trade-itis. Um, there's another reason. After bishop takes c6, I want you all to think about how you would recapture in this position, and then we'll take a vote. So think about it for a minute, because so I, I want everybody to participate in this one. All right, let's have that vote. How many people here would capture with the queen? OK, how many people would capture with the pawn? How many people would capture with the bishop? OK, um, anybody who captured with the uh, pawn want to give a reason why? Open the b file for the rooks. Yeah. OK, what else? And uh, also to hit e5 with the pawn. Mm -hmm. Anybody with bishop want to give a reason? Yeah? Okay, that's that's a decent reasoning, yeah. Um, also, I didn't really think opening up the B file was mm -hmm. important because the C file is already open. True. You're already, you're already ready to get that. Okay. So. Yeah. And I agree with that. I think that's a good reason. Um, that's a good reasoning. In the back. My concern was that that bishop on C six just doesn't have any options. So you you chose the pawn. I chose the pawn yeah. because. That bishop doesn't do much good there. The, the, the diagonal is pretty well covered at this point with white pawns, and the knights take the other squares away. So, what, which one did you pawn in the center? What did you choose? I chose the pawn as well because if the bishop takes, then the knight runs back to the center with them on the bishop, and you have to move. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, this is, this is great. You guys did a lot of good thinking here. Now, this is a wonderful example of where you need to think with words because variations um, are not really sufficing. I mean, there's not really a lot of tactics after bishop takes e6 or pawn takes e6. And this is what we call positional chess or strategic chess. Then you need experience and understanding in order to make the right choice. The correct choice is to take with the pawn. But um, you guys all made a lot of really good points. The reason the pawn is the best is because not because of the b-file, not as much because of the b-file, because you're, you're totally right that the c-file is also good. Um, the main thing here is this d5 square. The d5 square, having control over that's really useful, because frankly, white's position here is a little blah. And one of their only ideas is to get a knight to d5 in some position. You know, like, and for that to be good, like for instance, to 
try to get bishop g5, bishop f6, and knight d5, or to just get knight d5 in and then you know create pressure on the e file because they're going to be forced to take. That's one of White's only ideas. So when they take on c6 and we take back, like they really don't have a lot of play. Um, this this pawn protects a lot of their active play, and meanwhile we still have active play with rook b8 and a5 type stuff. Yes. Okay, I see that you're thinking the, the A pawn now is isolated, but at the same time, this pawn, we still have two pawn islands, right? We just moved to one really big one. Um, and I think that the A pawn is going to be used to try to um, go like A4 and really hammer on his weak B pawn. So what you're saying makes sense, but it's just not the overriding principle in the position, right? A lot of times in chess you have contrasting principles, so you have to pick one. And here the, this is more important. So um, as you'll see, it's kind of a theme that we're trying to destroy our opponent's counterplay. That's usually good. Because not only is it just good for obvious reasons, but it's also really extra annoying to a human opponent, right? We don't play against computers. We play against humans, and when when you deprive them of their activity, they get very upset, you know? They get antsy and make bad moves. So bishop h6 is fine. And now um, Marcel Duchamp made a bad positional error here, actually. Um, but something that's very instructive. So he did win this game, but here he made a bad move. He played the move c5, <laughs> which kind of contradicts everything we just talked about. Yeah. But I mean, if, if I didn't say all that, like, like it. I feel like c5 is a mistake that a lot of people make um, because it looks aggressive. He wants to maybe play c4, um, hit this knight, maybe play rook b8 in c4. So if you don't think about it more deeply, and knight d5 is not really possible yet because if you do it right now, it seems a little early. I mean, it might be possible actually just do it right away, but it's a little dicey. Um, but whether you can play a now or a next move, it's, it's just like you're never going to be able to move your pawn back to c6, right? That's, that's, a, that's why pawn moves are so important for strategic chess, where they say the pawns are the soul of chess. So, oh, instead of c5, just rook b8. And which pawn do you want to use to um, hammer this knight away and work on this pawn? Yeah? We want to use the A pawn, not the C pawn. Because the A pawn's not doing anything now anyway. And then suppose, uh, just to give you a sense of how bad this position is for white, because well, it's not that bad, but it's not very pleasant. Say white gets his king out of the way. We play A5, they play rook D1. I mean, they play A4 to stop it. They, they play A4 to stop A4. Um, well, I guess a4 is not an immediate threat because of knight takes e4, but it probably will become one soon because we can, because we can play queen a7 and a4. Um, but suppose they play a4, now what can we do? To further the pressure along this line. Yes, exactly. Bishop b6, a move that looks a little bit bizarre to non-Sicilian players because you're putting your bishop in front of a pawn. But you know what? We don't, weren't going to move this pawn anyway. And then this bishop hits this, bishop, this knight here, and there's a lot of pressure on this line. And see how we do this. And meanwhile, white has almost zero counterplay. So that, uh, that's what we want. But instead, uh, Duchamp played c5, and now anyway ended up getting a good position. Um, expanding here on the queen side. And I'm kind of going through this a little bit more quickly because uh, I want to make sure to show you the end of the game as well, <laughs> not just the beginning. Um, so rook a3 is a really nice move, just trying to increase the pressure in the position um, and stop white from ever being able to free himself with something like a4 and maybe knight b5 someday. Um, this move just stops a lot of white's active ideas. So this is kind of an interesting move, bishop c8. What do you think the idea is there? So bishop on d7 looks like it's more developed than on c8, 
but what can it do on C8 that it can't do on D7? Anyone who hasn't tried yet? Where do you think the bishop might be coming to? Yeah, what do you think? Which, with, yeah, exactly. After one of the knights, which square would you use? Yeah, very good. Bishop a6. So bishop a6, and notice you're just putting a lot of pressure on your opponent's position. Like this knight isn't take, this pawn is kind of loose. Um, and again, when you put all that pressure on your opponent, sometimes they'll top all. So bishop here developed, but doing nothing. Bishop here back to its starting square, but doing more. So that sometimes happens in positions where you have a big edge because uh, you just have more time because your opponent doesn't have any counterplay, right? No counterplay here for white. Well, as I say that, they make a move that gives a little bit of counterplay. Again, that move that he played earlier, c5, allowing a little bit of play on that d5 square, right? So now um, Duchamp played bishop to e6, hoping um, to just shut down that idea altogether. And now after rook d2, Rook to b4 was played. And now it's going to get kind of exciting. What do you think some of Black's options are here? Take a little, take a little thought here. So maybe White should have taken on e6 at some point. But I think uh, Black's idea was then, again, that pawn on e6 would have stopped the counterplay on d5. So think about what you might do with Black now. So we were talking earlier about the exchange in chess and how it's not worth that much to be up in exchange. So we have to be open to ideas that give up a rook and gain a lot of material in exchange. That's a big hint, sorry. Yeah, Wilson? Rook takes b3, beautiful move. Rook on, rook on I assume you meant that rook. Yeah, rook takes b3, very nice move. Now the idea is that after pawn takes b3, rook takes b3, look at how much material black is getting back by force, right? What are they going to get after, for instance, queen c1? They're also getting the knight back here, right? And now in this position, if you count up the material, what's going on? What's going on materially wise in this materially in this position? Ken? Black's up the exchange on the board. No, black's not up the exchange. You got it the reverse. Take a minute to count. I know we got some math math whizzes in the class. Black is up two pawns and and down the exchange, right? But, but, but there's a lot of the good things happening in his position. First of all, notice his king safety. Secondly, notice the activity of his rook and his queen. Thirdly, look at how dangerous this pawn is. So it seems to me that black is doing very well in this position. Um, I, I think white is in trouble, actually. So this would have been kind of bad. Yeah? You think it's even? So you don't you don't really think black has an advantage? I'm a two or one. Oh yeah. But if you look at the position, it looks like white um, doesn't have as much play as black, right? Like something like this, and now um, black's pawn here just looks very strong to me. Right? And even this king is still kind of weakened here. So I would uh, be very happy playing this position as black. But this still white should have done something like this. You know, there's certainly some fight left in that position. It's just that black is, in my opinion, much better. And it's much easier to play for black as well. Um, you, did you have a question? OK, I thought you had a question. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for white, he kind of panicked in this position. I guess he just thought that, that those lines we were looking at were so terrible with, um, you know, queens. 
after rook takes b3. You could even try queen a1. I think that's even better because I think this position is more, even more playable for white than the one we just looked at. Because why, how do we make a decision when we want to trade queens? It's very similar to the last position we looked at, except now there are no queens on the board. And last position, there were queens. So who does it benefit when queens are removed? Yeah? I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that because sometimes when you're defending, when you're attacking, you want to, when you're ahead, you want to trade queens to make the position more simple. Um, it's really about whose king is safer here, right? Um, if, you know, if you look at that position we were looking at earlier, um, it was definitely black's king who was sa safer, right? Like queen c1, rook c3. In this position, this king here is actually like almost impossible to attack, whereas this king is a little bit vulnerable on this diagonal, right? And even if it goes to h1, it still could get kind of um, get kind of back ranked at some point. So um, the king safety is really the issue. The safer your king, the more you want to keep queens on the board, right? So that's a logical way that in this position you could decide hey, I'm in a little bit of trouble. My opponent has plenty of compensation for the exchange, but it's probably a good idea for me to exchange queens here and try to play this position. Again, black is down the exchange and has two pawns for it. Instead, white panic mode and just took this here. Um, thinking that in this position, after rook b3, c4, of course, that's the idea now. We can get some material back that there would be some way to save here. Um, but in fact, um, we, we continue to, uh, to get this fork in, and uh, the pawn on d3 is just going to be really powerful, right? So here we have a queen for two rooks, but on top of that, this pawn on d3 is beautiful. And we have another pawn in addition, right? So. Um, very nice position for black. And the game was um, over pretty quickly thereafter. As you, as you see, still there's these issues with the king safety, right? So the knight can't take on d3, and the rook can't take on d3 because of what? What happens if rook takes d3? There's just a checkmate, right? Queen e1, checkmate. So that forces um, white to play h3. And now with the knight coming in and the pawn, beautiful, it's, uh, it's over, right? So these pawns coming into the game. And as you can see, the rooks are not working very well against the queen, right? Whether or not a queen is better than two rooks, again, has a lot to do with king safety and the coordination of the rooks. In this position, the rook is tied down to the defense of this pawn, so they're kind of useless compared to this very powerful queen. So that was uh, one of my favorite games by Marcel Duchamp. And I also showed you one of his losses and another one of his wins. I hope you um, enjoyed it. And uh, if you want to learn more about um, Duchamp and chess, you can check out this book, Marcel Duchamp, The Art of Chess. Um, and also there's just a lot of information about it online. So any other questions that you guys have? He was Master Yes, I think he was about Master Strength. Well, it's all relative, right? Because, you know, of course today the opening knowledge is a lot higher, but he was very strong. Mm -hmm.